Welcome back. Today's career video is on Pavel Bure. Now, normally when I do a career video, I go through their, their stats and how they did season by season and all this. With Bure, there's a lot of added baggage to the career. And while for younger fans, you're going to see the stats and you're going to see that he moved around a little, a little bit. Um, for as long as his knees would hold out, which sadly they, they did him in, um, he, he really should be a guy that's, you know, right up there with Ovechkin in terms of all time greatest goal scorers, but eventually his body said no. And, you know, it was too bad because when he was good, he was very, very good. So he's picked in 1989, 113th overall which caused a bit of a, an issue at the draft because other teams didn't think he was eligible. The Canucks made sure they found any loopholes they needed, <clears throat> so they were able to draft him. But other teams didn't think he was eligible to be drafted here. So they fought it. The Canucks obviously won. And they got Pavel Bray. So that's 89, and in 91, he comes over. And he comes over to play for 91-92. Now, when he joined the team, it was already in the middle of the season. The Canucks were already, already off to a really good start. So, this is why when the narrative is, well, the Canucks were terrible until Burray came in. No, they were off to a really good start in 91-92. Burray absolutely helped. Huge part of that team that year. But he only played 65 games, not due to injury, but because he joins them during the season. 34 goals, 26 assists, 60 points. And I still remember that first game for Burray. And how he, he brought everybody out of their seat on, I think it was his first shift. It was amazing. So he ended up winning the Calder, which surprised me. As I remember, it was Tony Amonti that I thought was going to win it that year. I thought that Burry only playing 65 games would cause him not to end up winning it. But he did. Uh, and he ended up scoring seven shorthanded goals that season, which was first overall in the NHL. Shorthanded, Burry was so dangerous. He was what Connor Brown is now in Ottawa, except he was also a huge goal scorer. Uh, but yeah, shorthanded, so dangerous. You'd have the puck and it's just gone. Uh, 13 games in the playoffs that year for Vancouver. Six goals, four assists, 10 points. And things are pretty good for the Canucks. They end up winning the division that year. They also win the division in 92-93. Uh, 83 games played for Bure that year. 60 goals, which was fifth in the NHL. I don't know what's more remarkable, that he had 60 goals or was only 5th in league scoring that year. 50 assists, 110 points. Uh, then, in the in the postseason, 12 games, 5 goals, 7 assists, 12 points. He did qualify for the All-Star game that year. No surprise. And he, he, he was the centerpiece for the Canucks at this stage. 93-94, plays 76 games, 60 goals, which was 1st in the National Hockey League that year. 47 assists, 107 points. This is before the Rocket Richard Trophy, so he doesn't get any hardware for that, as he had the Calder. And when he won the Calder, he was the first Canuck to win hardware. So, no Calder winner ever out of Vancouver. Hart Trophy, Vezina, nothing. So, it was it was a change for Canucks team that had been... The, they're called the Doormat Dynasty on one of the issues of, of the hockey news I have. Because that's what that's what it was at that point. They were they were the league's doormat. So in the playoffs that year, what's interesting is that the 93-94 season wasn't a great year for them. They seemed to be falling apart, but in the postseason it all clicked. 24 games, 16 goals, 15 assists, 31 points for Burry. He leads the playoffs in goal scoring with 16. There was some discussion about whether or not he was going to set the all-time record in goals in the playoffs, but the Rangers shut him down enough that he didn't actually uh, reach that record. But he's a first-team All-Star. He goes to the All-Star game, and his 25 power play goals was first in the NHL. 25 power play goals. Bure was sensational. So before Ovechkin, you had Bure. 94-95, a lockout shortened season. Everything just felt different. It it just felt different. And this is where the relationship between Bure and the team and the fans really seemed to change. 44 games that year. Again, lockout shortened season. 20 goals, 23 assists, 43 points. And it just, I know 20 goals in 44 games seems like a lot, but for Bure, it just felt like he wasn't himself. They're just It just felt like something was off. 11 games in the playoffs, he scored better there. 7 goals, 6 assists for 13 points. Uh, the following season, he misses almost the entire season due to injury. Uh, 15 games played, 6 goals, 7 assists, 13 points. So when he does play, he's not scoring at the same rate that he normally would. And again, it felt like the relationship between Bure and the Canucks was 
getting closer to breaking here. 96, 97, well, the Canucks are trying desperately to get back to where they were in 94, including bringing in Messier, and, and they would get McGillney with the idea that if you have McGillney and Burray together, just imagine, you know, just imagine, because they had played together at the World Juniors with Fedorov in the middle. Now, the Red Wings weren't going to trade you Fedorov, so they, they tried it, and, and, and it, it never really clicked. Either McGillney was going or Burray was going. And it was frustrating to fans watching because you, you couldn't get both. They're both 50 goal scorers. If they could both get going at the same time, the Canucks would have been lethal. Um, you look at that roster from 97, 98, 96, 97. They were good rosters. They just It just didn't add up. So that 96, 97 season, 63 games. He did play in the All-Star game. 23 goals, 32 assists, 55 points. 23 goals in 63 games is a failed season for Beret. There were a lot of critics, uh, a lot of people saying he was floating around out there. One big difference between his game when he first joined the NHL and later on was he was very physical that first year. He was hitting everything that moved. And as time went on and he's making more money, uh, it, it, it that, that part of his game, it seemed like it kind of petered out. And injuries will do that too, right? 97, 98, he plays the full season, 82 games. And he bounces back as a goal scorer. 51 goals, which was third. 39 assists for 90 points. Also third. All-star game. And he finished first in the NHL in shorthanded goals with six. So, what happens? How does he end up out of Vancouver? Burry had a lot of reasons to be angry. He had a list of grievances. He really did. Um, first off, he felt the Canucks too, took too long to visit him. When he was in California in 1991 after he left. After he left Russia. When he came over. He felt like they they kind of, alright, you're in California. Alright, well, we'll be down later. He didn't like how long it took. Um, he didn't like that his contract in 1993 was in, was in Canadian dollars. He said they had agreed to pay him in American dollars. They were paying him in Canadian dollars instead. All contracts now are American dollars in part because of this. Canadian dollars are usually... And I say usually because there have been times where the Canadian dollar is above the American dollar. It's rare though. And the Canadian dollar usually lags about 20% below the American dollar. So Canadian players, American players, doesn't matter. They want to get paid in US dollars. So he was mad about that. And then he was mad because there was a rumor that Pavel Bure threatened to hold out for more money. He didn't like his contract offers before the playoffs in 1994. Bure denies that ever happened. He says, I never threatened to hold out. Never happened. But he was mad because the Vancouver Canucks didn't come out publicly and say, that didn't happen. So it, it really left a bad taste in his mouth that the Canucks didn't come out and say that in his, on his behalf. Also, 94-95, Assistant General Manager George McPhee criticized the goal scoring of Pavel Bure. So while he's not having a great year, you got an assistant general manager going, eh, I don't know. I, you know, Pavel, yeah. And he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He felt like he was a star player. And he didn't feel like he was being treated like a star player in Vancouver. Um, he also didn't like the fact that he didn't get paid during the lockout. He felt that the way his contract was set up, that even though they were locked out by the owners, he should be getting paid. And he didn't like that they didn't pay him. And, and again, the interesting thing is all of these items could easily have been fixed by Pat Quinn, George McPhee, Brian Burke. Any of them could have fixed these things. They could have come out with a statement in 94 saying he did not threaten to hold out. He didn't threaten not to play. That didn't happen. Uh, they, they could have made sure his contract was in U.S. dollars. As soon as he brought it up, said, yeah, no, you're right. It's in U.S. dollars. Um, and also, he felt that he was underpaid in 94. So his agent was Ron Salser. And uh, Ron Salser said, sign it. He's like, I don't I don't think this is the right amount of money. I think I should be able to get more. The market is, is going up. He saw that salaries were going through the roof and the Canucks were offering him less money than what he was worth. And this was a criticism I had of the Canucks back then. I felt like the way that they they valued players was they undervalued them. I remember Cliff Ronning wanting a million dollars a year and I'm pretty sure it was Brian Burke that said, we don't think Ronning's worth a million dollars a year. And I remember at the time I had hair, so I pulled it out because it was so frustrating to me to watch as Cortnell, Ronning, Burre, these guys were gone. And and almost every case, it was the Canucks going, eh, we don't think that they're worth X amount of dollars. And so you watched a team that had been the doormat dynasty 
become a pretty good team in the early 90s just to watch it all get frittered away. So he sits out. He sits out in 1998. And Brian Burke warned him. Burke told him, you're not going anywhere until January. He said, you have to come in and play in October, November to get your value up. If you're not on the ice, you have no value. And Beret was like, all right. He didn't care. Beret's opinion was, I am done with the Canucks. And Burke sat him down and he basically said, I don't have a problem with Brian Burke, but I don't, I have major problems with the Canucks organization. I've, I've outlined all of that right here. He had also, in 1997, got rid of Ron Salser and switched over to Mike Gillis as his agent. Yes, boys and girls, he switched over to Mike Gillis to get out of Vancouver. You can't write this stuff. So he goes to Mike Gillis on the recommendation of Jeff Cortnell, who said, hey, if you want to get out of here, go to my agent. So he did. And Mike Gillis tried quietly behind the scenes saying, look, my, my client wants out of Vancouver. He wants to go. Burry had a fantastic last year in Vancouver, 51 goals. And they just couldn't trade him. So he does finally get traded. Uh, January 17th of 1999. All of this ends up being changed in, in a heartbeat. And remember, the Canucks at this point are just, they're, they're down at the bottom. So for Canuck fans, Burray at this point, holding out when he's already one of the top paid players on the Canucks, Canuck fans think, well, that seems kind of greedy, but he's holding out for a trade. And, you know, we don't understand that he feels that the Canucks treat star players badly. And, and at, the, at the same time, this is where a lot of players are leaving Vancouver. Um, so January 17th, 1999, he's traded with a 2000 third round pick. Brad Ferentz, and Brett Hedekin. And Hedekin was upset at this trade too because he felt like the Canucks had lost all faith in him. They were dumping him off. And and I thought that was weird because I thought Hedekin was a good defenseman. And he was tr they were traded for a 2000 first round pick, which was Nathan Smith, uh, Mike Brown, Dave Gagne, Ed Jovanovsky, and Kevin Weeks. And Burke apparently insisted on Jovanovsky being part of the deal as well as Gagne. Really wanted Dave Gagne. Gagne didn't work out with the Canucks, but Jovanovski absolutely did. So Burry gets to Florida. And as players often do, when they get out of bad situations, if you're a Jack Eichel fan, listen up. When, fan, when players get out of bad situations and they go somewhere where they might feel more appreciated, they might feel like they're finally going to get a chance to really play their game, uh, Burry exploded. Only 11 games played in Florida. 13 goals, 3 assists, 16 points. So right off the bat, it looks like both Florida and Vancouver got what they wanted. And so 1999-2000, his first full season in Florida, 74 games, 58 goals. This is when goal scoring is down. So he wins his first Rocket Richard Trophy, 36 assists, 94 points. Florida reaches the playoffs in four playoff games, one goal, three assists, four points. He's a second team All-Star. He wins that Rocket Richard. He's third in heart voting. It's the highest he ever got in heart voting. And he goes to the All-Star game, and his 14 game-winning goals are first overall in the NHL. So yes, Jovanovski ends up being a beast for the Vancouver Canucks, but Bure plays very well in Florida, even though it's not for that long. 2000-2001, uh, he plays the full 82-game season. Uh, 59 goals, which is again first, wins another Rocket Richard. 33 assists, 92 points. He's a second-team All-Star, does win that Rocket trophy. All-Star game, scored 29.5% of the goals Florida scored that year. So almost 30% of their goals were Bure. Meaning Florida didn't score very many goals, and Bure scored a lot of goals. And it, it really showed that, that Bure could be a one-man show. That it, it didn't really matter who his wingers were, he was going to score. It didn't, or it didn't matter who his center and the other winger was, he was going to score. Um, one of the best shots in the league, exciting and great player. The problem is that we get into a stage where his knees are, are at a point where he can't really play and speed is his game. So if your knees are an issue, both your speed game kind of falls by the wayside. 2001, 2002, he plays 56 games for Florida, 22 goals, 27 assists, 49 points. One thing that's notable again with Burry is you'll notice his goal scoring fluctuates here and there. And in 96-97 with Vancouver, it looked like he wasn't happy. 2001-2002, it looked like he was kind of done with the losing in Florida. Uh, March 18th, he's traded with a 2002 second for a 2002 first round pick, second, as well as a 2003 fourth round pick, Philip Novak and Igor Ulanov. 
So Igor Ulanov video incoming? Maybe. Uh, but with the Rangers, again, after a trade, huge pickup by Bure in his production. 12 games, 12 goals, 8 assists, 20 points. And so he's with the New York Rangers, and he seems to be happy. But that final season turns out to be 0-2-0-3. Uh, and again, it's just injuries wear him down. 39 games, 19 goals, 11 assists for 30 points. So Bury at the end of his career, 702 games played, 437 goals, which is 71st on the all-time list. 342 assists for 779 points. In the playoffs, 64 games, 35 goals, 35 assists for 70 points. The interesting thing is he makes the Hall of Fame in 2012, well after when he's first eligible, because he only played 700 games, because he only scored 437 goals, which is well below a lot of other Hall of Famers. Burray's induction in 2012 kind of allowed, as well as Cam Neely's, kind of allowed for other players who've had shortened careers to now maybe be able to circle back and say, hey, so Hall of Fame. Um, 2017, he was named to the 100 greatest players ever, which to me is kind of interesting in that he did have his great seasons, but he also had his down years along the way, and he only played the 700 games. So nobody complained about him being in the 100 greatest players ever, and I understand. Because again, those highlight reel goals, the 60 goal seasons of which he had two, should have had four, but he ended up with two, uh, it really stands the test of time, doesn't it? 34 shorthanded goals, which is 11th on the all-time list. 20 hat tricks, which is 15th on the all-time list. So he can score goals by the bushelful. He is he is a goal scorer, a uh, fantastic goal scorer. And, you know, if it wasn't for the holding out until the trade, if it wasn't for the injury shortened seasons, and again... The relationship between him and the Canucks was so broken by the time he left Vancouver, it was decades before it got resolved. And it, the other thing with Burry was he was a very private person. And I, I don't think that, and again, this is just me talking here. I, I don't think he liked the constant prying about his personal life and about everything else off the ice because he wanted to keep that as private as possible. Uh, his relationship with, uh, with Gino Ogic was always very close, very strong. And when Gino left the team, I, I don't think he was happy about that either. But, you know, uh, that that's the thing. Vancouver didn't really treat the players coming through that era, I thought, as well as they should have. And Burray felt that way as well. And so here we are, all these years later, and talking about Pavel Burray's career. So, one of the best goal scorers? Absolutely. One of the most exciting players? Yes. And... Sadly, did not get a Stanley Cup ring in his time. One game short in 1994. What could have been? All right, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below regarding the, the, the career of Pavel Bure. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.